following interview was conducted with Charles P. Ruff, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the University Oral History Program. It took place on uh, Tuesday, July the 20th, 2010 in Stewart Center. Also sitting in is his wife, Roberta. And the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you very much. This is part two. Uh, we'll pick up a little bit with the Senate and also the University Library Committee, mm -hmm. which you serve on. Well, I, um, I was actually on the University Senate for over nine years, and um, during that time saw a lot of changes in the University and a lot of changes in the, the actions of the Senate. The, uh, I, was, I came onto the Senate shortly after uh, President Baring came in as president and was out in the Senate the whole time that he was here as president. And, then was involved in the Senate Selection Committee for the, you know, selecting President Jensky because as a chair of one of the standing committees of the Senate, we were automatically on that selection committee. And so I got involved in that. A lot of work. There was a lot of work involved, but also very, you know, very rewarding in certain aspects. And it opened my eyes to a lot of different areas of the university that I wouldn't have had sure. as just a faculty member. Part of the, uh, before I actually came onto the Senate, I was a member of the Ag Library Committee and then became a member on the uh, University Library Committee. And uh, continued in that role even uh, after I became a member of the, uh, of the Senate and also chair and, and member and chair of the uh, University Resources Policy Committee. I uh, continued my work with the University Library Committee all during that whole time. Right. We're researchers tell what the University Library Resources and the Library Committee just want to make a mention that <clears throat> for the researchers so they understand. Well, the University Resources Policy Committee has several committees of the university that answers to the Resource Policy Committee. And the University Library Committee is one of those. And you know, just like all the facilities committees, you know, answer the to the resource policy and so uh, we were uh, brought up to date on a semi-annual basis with all the uh, sure. direction that the library was wanting to go. Of course, being on, you know, on the University Library Committee itself, I also was aware of it from that aspect of it. But each, you know, about every six months, the Library Committee would come in and make a formal presentation to the Resource Policy Committee. Okay. The whole committee itself? Yes. Okay. Okay. And so, um, we had regular reports from these committees during the year. Right, and Emily Mobley was the dean. Emily Mobley was the dean, okay. and uh, I was uh, very much aware and encouraged Emily to make some of the changes that she made when she was in here as dean because of our direction to move and the way the technology was moving to get us involved into the digital area right. and getting uh, information placed at the, at the uh, desk of all our staff members because it was becoming very obvious that we, if we didn't make that move, then a lot of our research information wouldn't be, wouldn't be used. It wouldn't be available. Wouldn't be available and wouldn't be used if it, you know, right. unless it was available in that direction right, exactly. because the staff members were being pulled in so many different ways that they had to be very efficient in their use of uh, past information. Right and be able to access it very quickly, and that was by far the best way to do it. All right. And so she was able to make some of those moves with support of, of uh, Executive Vice President Ringo and, and the President and so on, and she was able to get financial support to make some of those moves, and otherwise it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And it worked very well. And yeah. she was able to, to see the insight and see that move, and moving our library from determining their size by a number of volumes in the in the collection to what was our access of the digital information and I think that the was electronic a, access, that's the electronic right. access right. and that was a that was a major philosophy change no question about it uh, right, right. Uh, were you a faculty advisor for any of the groups at all? Um, I, asked you that. I started out um, when I came on the faculty uh, I came here on a postdoctoral in 68 and went on rector faculty in 70 in 71 I joined Purdue Pilots, which at that time was a student-staff-oriented uh, 
flying club here on the campus. I had my private pilot's license through aviation technology. You got it while you were here? While I was here, on, on faculty. And um, then became involved in, in Purdue Pilots in, you know, Incorporated. And um, we were by far one of the largest uh, student-based flying clubs in the nation at the time. And um, the, yeah, that's uh, interesting. I was, uh, at the time when the students were, were having trouble getting good leaders involved in the uh, Purdue Pilots, I actually for one year served as president, which was kind of strange and, you know, we didn't want to do it, but we were forced to because we didn't have the student leaders. But then um, went on over and, and became faculty advisor to Purdue Pilots and remained as faculty advisor for over 30 years. That's wonderful. What, t what kind of activities would they be involved in? Well, we were training at the, on the average of about 22 to 25 pilots a year through the club. So you actually We actually, uh, we transitioned from Tri-Pacer aircraft over to Cherokee 140s, you know, during this time. And for, um, for many years in there, the Purdue Pilots was the second largest student organization on the campus. It was only rivaled by the experimental theater because we had valued, you know, our aircraft were valued in, in excess of about $250,000. And these were owned by Purdue Pilots Incorporated. And um, then we ran everything through as a student organization. And, oh. and Did you take any, any flying trips at all? Oh yeah, no? I flew all over the nation with, you know. Any one that, any special one that you remember, that you recall? Well, I can, Tell you, one, tell you one very interesting Good. one. <laughs> um, Professor Joe White uh, was here on, you know, and he and, and, and I shared a common major prof on our PhD degree, and that was M.L. Jackson in Wisconsin. Well, he was here on faculty, and George Van Skoik had just come onto the faculty in agronomy. Well, we needed to go out to the Clay Merrill's meetings out in, in Norwalk, in Connecticut. And so uh, I asked them if they wanted to fly out with me, and we'd take, you know, I'd get one of the Purdue Pilots aircraft, and we'd fly out. Well, I had my instrument rating, and so we were flying out, and Air Traffic Control Center vectored us into a thunderstorm out over, over Pennsylvania. And so we had to land in Allentown, Pennsylvania, to let a, th a thunder, you know, uh, line go through, a thunderstorm line. And so we stayed overnight and then got up the next morning, perfectly clear, blue skies, took off, you know, out of Allentown. We weren't airborne for about a half an hour and punched into a cloud deck and we were solid bank clouds all the way into Norfolk and shot the instrument approach into Norfolk right in the middle of the runway and, <laughs> and landed for a meeting. And so, <laughs> <laughs> well, we survived it. <laughs> you made it anyway, right. I hope the return trip was a little bit more. Anyway, it, it was a little, it was a little bit nicer coming back. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! But you still keep you keep in touch with the club? Uh, I haven't. Uh, uh, I re stepped out of uh, the faculty uh, advisory position about uh, must have been in about ninety eight or ninety nine, and would stayed involved a little bit, you know, with it until I retired. But since I retired, no, yeah. um, I still see some of the people. And, sure. You know, but the club keeps pretty active, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They, uh, see, during the whole time that I was in the club and until and right before uh, I stepped down as faculty advisor, we had to transition the club over from being based out at Eretz Airport to being based at Purdue Airport. Oh, you were out of Eretz. We were out of Eretz. Oh, okay. um, uh, that's where the club actually started was in Eretz Airport. And um, they continued to be based there until Ruth, you know, Eretz had to sell the airport and, you know, after Don passed away. And then um, we, you know, started in trying to transition back into Purdue Airport. And we were able to pull that transition off and get it based out of, yeah. out of Purdue Airport. And they're still based out of Purdue Airport now. Of course, you know, Cap Harris is the one who was when Amelia was here. And That's there's right. those pictures that you've seen. And it's yeah. been kind of nice. Yeah, and, and see, and I knew Don. See, Cap was Don's uh, father. Oh, okay. And uh, and I knew Don and Ruth very well. Sure. And uh, then 
you know, Don, you know, just collapsed down on a runway one day and he passed away from a heart attack, massive heart attack. Mm. And, and uh, it caught Ruth totally off guard, but she continued to run the airport for many years after that. Right. And we continued out there as a club. Is it used as any, for any purpose these days? Well, or it's, airport is uh, outside Lafayette. Yeah, the Air, it's airport is, was located just, um, it would be north and, and east of the junction of, of um, the bypass or Interstate I-65 and uh, US-25. And that airport is closed now. And uh, there's a couple industries that are out there now uh, on part of that airport, but the runway is no longer used. Oh, okay. All righty. Uh, let's talk a little about the um, agronomy department, uh, how it's grown, or some comments well, on uh, uh, anything you want to say. The uh, agronomy department's m made some very good changes since, uh, and some of it, you know, was, was a result of Dr. Peterson coming here after, the, after World War II and starting to build a department. He was able to build a department and, and cover all the, the main four areas of, a, of an agronomy department, and a research extension, teaching, and, uh, and uh, uh, foreign you know, you know, studies, international right. studies. Right. And he was able to develop and, and hire faculty into these areas because he felt there was a need to having top-notch teachers, and but there was also a need of having some good basic research people to back up some of the things we were teaching. And there was also we need to be able to educate the people out in the state of Indiana. And so he developed, you know, the three and four major arms of the department uh, with top-notch faculty, and he was able to hire these people very, very easily over and build a, a department. Um, I was lucky enough to, to actually come here on a postdoctoral with Dr. Peterson and then uh, continued on on the regular faculty. Then uh, after that, see, uh, Mar Phillips took over as department head and see, John, uh, John Peterson was department head for 25 years. Mar Phillips was department head for 20 years. And so, which is very, very unusual for a department head to be in a position that long. Certainly in today's times, that's not yes, true. Yes, it just, it just didn't happen. All right. And as a result, he had a very large legacy, you know, because when I came here as a, as a new uh, staff member, he had hired all but one of the faculty in our department. And so, you know, which is very unusual for a department head to be able to say that. <laughs> and, uh, and mean it, right. And, and mean it. You right. know, he, he built the department. There right. was no question about it right. by the people he hired. And I also know that he went way beyond hiring a professional staff member. He hired them in character as well, which you can do today. I know that there, for instance, I know of at least two people that he called in on interview. They were not hired. He decided they wouldn't work with the faculty he had in place. He refused to hire them. They went on to have a very prolific research career at other institutions, but he didn't feel that they would work with the faculty he had yeah, in place. Yeah. And he had the gumption at that time and the power to decide whether those people would be hired here or not. And as a result, he developed a very close-knit working uh, sure. faculty in the agronomy department. And it remained a way the whole time I was here. You know, even under Mark Phillips, it was a very close-knit department, very, you know, more family-oriented, you know, and, and really a friendly department. Not only, good working you know, relationship. Oh, yeah. Right. And it was recognized over the campus. Yeah, that's good. You know, because of that camaraderie within the department. And it was not just with the faculty. It was with our clerical staff, you know, our, all our technicians and everybody who just felt the same way. How did he build the department in Rome wise and did he found the graduate program in the field? He'd be, you know, as a result of getting good faculty in here, there's no question the graduate enrollment, you know, in the sure. department, you know, increased dramatically. Um, you know, during that time he was building the department. Now by the time I came, in reality the graduate student, you know, numbers were pretty well stabilized. We were in the forty and fifty range. We may have gotten up to seventy at one time. Uh, 
you know, depending again on how many research grants and so on. But uh, the uh, he still had, you know, in the department we had those faculty members that were more dedicated to doing, you know, our main, uh, you know, undergraduate teaching. And then there were some of them, like myself, that was more involved in basic research. True, I did some teaching. Sure. You know, but, you know, I trained students on how to, how to present technical information in seminars. And we trained them very well because, you know, we had students that were recognized in all the national organizations as being able to present top-notch technical presentations. And, uh, but my main thrust was in basic research. Uh, whereas, you know, other people in our department like Bill McPhee and Jim Ulrichs, and so on, these people were hired to be teachers. Right. It was a combination of all It was a, That's right, and that was the key to it. It was right. a, somebody with the vision to see the need of having specialties in, their, in the department and not just hire for research and hope that they can do some teaching. Make it a working unit all the way around. You know, we had, we had teachers that were hired to be teachers and then have the capability of working closely with our research faculty to do some research on the side and still be involved in doing basic research. Right. What, about, uh, how, what about development? How did that change over time? Development, development and advancement changed over time too. Well, um, the whole university, the, uh, the whole, the whole university, changed. no question. Right. You know that changed uh, over this whole period of time, and and uh, the uh, the university, the university started putting more rigid guidelines on how people were promoted and how they developed in their careers, and and there was much more documentation required. You know, whereas before, uh, under Dr. Peterson, basically. You promoted when Dr. Peterson felt it was a time for you to go up for a promotion. You know, it normally went through. Uh, but as as the university grew and as as the departments, you know, and, uh, somebody as a department head for that long a period of time, when you were undergoing a very growth, you know, large growth phase, had a lot of power in getting people, you know, promoted and getting them advanced. Uh, when you start in getting changes in that in that upper echelon that are changing so rapidly, they don't have that power within the university to make those kinds of decisions. And so you see it being done more by uh, direction, directly from, from the upper administration and a series of, okay, here's the guidelines. And so essentially the committee makes that decision. It's changed a lot. It's changed a lot, no question about it. I, others have shared the similar thing in the earlier years. It's a lot easier than it is now. <laughs> oh yeah, and 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 I saw it even toward the latter part. You know, when I was promoted, you know, going up, you know, through the you know ranks from associate to full, uh, I could see it then. Yeah. You know, to see the big changes that were taking place. Well, it's hard though sometimes to share with people. It's it's not the end of the world. You know, there are other things that you can do if you don't. But yeah. sometimes it's hard to convince the people because mm -hmm. we That's had right. colleagues over time that had to move elsewhere. So. Yeah. And we've lost some good, you know, we've lost you some do. colleagues you out do. of the agronomy department, and we've lost some, you know, because they weren't promoted. We've lost some because they were promoted, but still found other. They may know. took advantage of another opportunity that right. came down the road. Yeah, that's true. Um, how about family? You have children, and we have uh, we have two children. Okay. Uh, we have a daughter who is a catastrophic nurse in a hospital in Indianapolis. She, it's a, nurturing, a nursing profession that involves patients that are under extreme uh, hospital care. They must be slated to be in a hospital for at least six weeks for them to ever be accepted into the hospital where she's at. Is it a specialized? It's a specialized nursing huh. situation. She may only have at most two patients when she goes in. It's like a private, almost like a private. It is a private hospital. Oh, okay. And. Uh, She'll go in, you know, and she'll have many times just one patient because these are patients that require, you know, constant, constant, you know, care and medication, care and medication, and supervision, and supervision sure. et cetera. Yeah. Our son, uh, and Bethany got her undergraduate degree here at Purdue. Uh, she went on and, and has an RN. She 
got her degree here and then went actually over to St. E and got an R got an R in mm-hmm. you know, St. Joseph and St. E. Then um, our son is four years younger than Bethany, and um, he always knew from eighth grade he was going to be a lawyer. I finally talked him into into doing something other, you know, for his undergraduate work than going into social you know sciences or something and so he actually got his undergraduate degree in honors chemistry here at Purdue and co-opted at the same time and so he went up and uh, during his undergraduate co-op with the chemistry department which is a little unusual because most of the co-op program at that time was run through engineering not through chemistry (coughs) excuse me and so uh, he co-opted and in four years graduated and was going to go on and get an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering. And um, they asked him why. He says, you can get a master's in the same length of time. And so he actually went in and got a master's in, in chemical engineering. And uh, then uh, from there, he went to University of Minnesota and the law school. And is now a patent lawyer, senior member in a patent law firm in D.C. Patents are really the big thing these days. That's right. And uh, he was promoted very quickly in, in a law firm there, and that's all they do is patent law. And with that chemical background, engineering background. Well, that and the chemical and the engineering, because many of the times you find that the patents are what they refer to as process patents. And these involve processes that have a scientific, you know, chemistry background, but they're process oriented. And so with his engineering background, it gives him an unusual uh, position in a law firm. Right. Because he has both. He has that expertise that they need. Yes. Yeah. Awards and honors. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, to look at the slide reel collection. This is a, for the research, a collection of people who've been at Purdue that had slide reels, and you made a contribution. <laughs> How'd that come about? Bob well, Miles was the one that shepherded that, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, the, uh, all it came about because... When I was going through, you know, as an undergraduate, I was at the University of Missouri. <clears throat> that's what we were using, you know. That, you well, know, Jim we didn't, still has you didn't, you don't have, we didn't have these little calculators. Man, there wasn't anything like that around, and uh, and so the only thing you had either your great big, you know, uh, cranking calculator that set and took up half your desk, or your slide rule. And so, the old NCR stuff, that probably. Oh, yeah. And so I, I grew up, you know, as I went through college, that's all I had, you know, for doing all my math work with, with slide rules. And so when I came here, they were looking at trying to, you know, calculators starting coming in. And so these slide rules were regularly gated to the back of my drawer of my desk in my office. And so, you know, I didn't use them for many, many years. And so they started putting together a slide rule collection over in the engineering school. And so uh, I had one of the few Versalog slide rules, which was a state of the art at the time they were out. Very good slide rule. And I had magnifying glasses on it. So they're fairly accurate. And so it, it was quite a state of the art for a slide rule. But uh, it was one of the few that they had that was at that caliber. I'm and sure that's true. Neil yeah. Armstrong could contributed to his. He, he did. It was he a did. nice, nice display, nice yeah. exhibit. It was. Yeah. And, it was very and I, last I knew it, they had it out at least four or five years ago because I remember going over and looking at yeah, it. Over in the, the Potter. Time, you know, yeah. Potter. Right. And so I knew it was still, it was still put together. We they we the archives got it, we have it, but they since then they requested it to have it back so we well, there is an inventory of it but they wanted it to have it back so i'm not sure where it's displayed but that's what <laughs> happened to it, you know. well, I, you know, it, it was, it was a nice the, display though the one slide rule that i wish that they had that um, i had and i used quite a bit you, was you a had two cir- of them you had two of them seven, number 77 and 78 i think right? it was one of them circular oh i don't know i just had the numbers but you you were part of the you know, I, 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 I've history. forgotten. I had a circular slide reel too, which was very unusual. Oh yeah. You know, and I used it quite a bit because it had a lot. Of, it would be equivalent to normal slide reels about a foot. You know, sure. twelve, thirteen inches. A circular slide reel, eight inches, see, is equivalent to about a thirty-inch slide reel. 
and so it's much more high precision, but yet it will still fit. Did you give that? Did you donate? That and one? I think I'm, I, I honestly don't remember, okay. because I don't remember whether it was donated, or whether I just lost it, okay. <laughs> because I, will, I had both of them at one time, I will and I don't have you, either one. <laughs> I so, will check that and see what I'm listing you know, on that. Because um, I really don't know. I just yeah. honestly have forgotten. The, you were the president of Gamma Sigma Delta? Yes, I was. And what took for the researchers? What well, Gamma Sigma uh, Delta is the Ag Honorary. Okay. See, the undergraduate Ag Honorary is Alpha Zeta. Okay. The Gamma Sigma Delta is actually an honorary for graduate student and faculty. Uh, a national. A national. Uh, and um, it so happened that I was uh, under, as a senior in a school of agriculture, you can be nominated to Gamma Sigma Delta, but only as a senior. Uh, whereas in Alpha Zeta, you can be nominated at the end of the sophomore year. Uh, and I was nominated for Alpha Zeta at the University of Missouri, and then bef uh, in my junior year, and then in my senior year, I was nominated in the Gamma Sigma Delta, and was uh, initiated in the chapter at the University of Missouri. When I went to University of Wisconsin on my PhD program, I was a charter member of the Gamma Sigma Delta chapter at the University of Wisconsin uh, there, and so I was member of that chapter. When I came here, I was a charter member of the Gamma Sigma Delta chapter here. Just comes with you. <laughs> I bring it with me, right? You know, to Purdue. And, and so I was actually one of the charter members of the, of the Gamma Sigma Delta chapter here. Very good. I went on to serve in, in many roles in the, you know, in the Gamma Sigma Delta organization as well as president, mm -hmm. you know, one year. And initiated, you know, some programs where we had some top-notch, you know, ag research people that were recognized as, as merit scholars and would have them present a, a special annual seminar, you know, here on the campus. And we brought people from outside as well yeah. into that seminar. Back to your family, since your wife is sitting in, where did you meet your wife? My she wife can, or she can answer that, huh? <laughs> uh, We met at the University of Missouri. Okay. Uh, See, I had gone to Southeast Missouri State at Cape Girada and then transferred to the University of Missouri in my junior year. Roberta started her freshman year at the University of Missouri when I transferred up there as a junior. And so academically, I was about two years ahead of her. But it so happened that, you know, I did my undergraduate work and then I did my master's work. And see, we met probably would have been a latter part of my junior year, which would be her, in her freshman year. And then um, we got married in 64, and um, then I graduated in 65 from the University of Missouri. And um, she got her degree, you know, I stayed on an extra semester on my master's program so she could get finished up. and. Um, and then she graduated, and then we went to Wisconsin. Okay, went together. Sounds good. <laughs> the um, Agronomy Journal. You were involved in the uh, that do it, pulling the hundred years or something like that. For no, I got back uh, about the time I was getting ready to retire. I, uh, I had an occasion to be serving on the Publications Committee of the of the uh, Agronomy Journal was one of them. See, the Agronomy. American Society of Agronomy mm -hmm. uh, is an umbrella organization along with the Crop Science Society of America and the Soil Science Society of America. It's a tri-society. And um, between, the, between the three organizations, they publish four journals and, uh, you know, scientific journals. And some of these journals go back over 100 years. And um, so... As a member of the publications committee and after, you know, of the, of the tri-societies and then at the same time being a member of the library committee here and seeing what was, what was happening in the whole area of technology development and what Emily Mobley was trying to do with the libraries here, it became apparent to me that we were needing 
a way of getting all of our past information that's published in those journals electronically available. And the only way that this could be done is if we as a tri-society decide to do it. Because there was no, there were some groups that were trying to do it on some of the older journals, but not in the agronomic area. Uh, none of, nobody in agriculture. You know, um, there was a group out in California uh, called J JSTOR that was doing some of the journals electronically. But there was mainly in the, uh, you know, like Science Magazine and, and things like this that were more broad, but nothing in agriculture. And so I approached the Soil Science Society, uh, being a member of the Publications Committee, about doing this with the argument that unless we do this, then all of our information that is not electronically available to the desktop of our researchers won't be used in the future. Because the time frame is just too short for graduate students and their faculty to spend the time to go to the library and dig this stuff out and, go and not be, you know, because none of it's searchable. And so they bought into it. And uh, so I started out with the Soil Science Society Journal first. And um, with the Soil Science Society backing, <clears throat> we were able to find a firm that could um, take and scan in the whole journal all the way from volume one, issue one. And um, before we even started in going after the Soil Science Society Journal, Crop Science came on board, the Agronomy Journal came on board, and um, so we had four journals that um, became uh, involved under this umbrella. Before it was all over with, we scanned over 470,000 pages in all four journals, all the way back to Volume 1, Issue 1, and then brought it up to, to year 2000. Everything since year 2000 is available electronically. What'd you do with the hard copy? What do you mean the... The original, the, the journals themselves, the hard copy. Well, what we did is we were able, the, all the agronomy, uh, society had a complete hard copy of, of the, all the journals and so we were able to put together a complete hard copy and so those those were actually cut and so they could go through high speed scanners it's amazing isn't it but we chose a firm see I wanted two things I wanted a copy that was readily you know that you could actually see the page. You could see all the photographs. And I wanted something that was searchable. And so it took us some time to find the right firm because what this firm did is they double scanned it. They went in and scanned all the pages at 300 DPI black and white. That gave us high quality text. Then they went back and rescanned every page that had a photograph on it in 150 DPI grayscale. And those that had color photographs in it, which were very limited, you know, because very few of the journals had color, sure. you know, before 2000. Uh, we scanned all the color in, in high resolution color. But they went back in and scanned those in grayscale and then embedded them back into the black and white copy. So you had then available to you a page that was high resolution black and white print with a grayscale photograph on the same page. Then they buried behind that all the text for OCR, optical character recognition, and then we set the search engines up. And so they're fully searchable. That's great. And did, we, did you do the did you do the advertisements? <coughs> or did you put those in or not? Uh, we did every page. Okay. In those four journals, there's, there would mo at most be only one or two pages for advertisement. They were just to fill in pages at the back. <coughs> so those are very limited. What did the membership think when they got it done? Well, the way we paid for it was we made uh, 
once it was all done, we sold the DVDs. Or in that day, in that kind, it was four DVDs, or actually CDs. Uh, yeah. We sold the CDs to the membership. The agronomy, uh, the Soil Science Society of America covered their cost of all the scanning in the first six and a half months. By the sales? By the sales. And they are still being sold today, particularly overseas. You know, the institutions overseas are still buying it today. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, you know, at this time, this was, a, you know, I, in order to go through and make sure everything was done correctly, I actually verified every page. I pulled up every page, scanned it, and, and looked at them on the screen. You know, and so when we when we went out to final publication on those CDs, they were, they were ready to go. They were ready to go. Right, right. And that's the only way we could, you know, we couldn't turn that over to anybody. Well, see, a lot of this was done after I retired. You know, I started it. I started it about probably six months before I retired. I ended it two and a half years later. So I was all involved in it for over three years. You know, mainly working at home. Sure, it's your project. But you wanted to see it. You, know, you started it, and wanted, and wanted, wanted a good job. You because, wanted to see it done right. And it was done. It was done right. And uh, so, uh, and we got all of our journals in. There, as a result today, they're fully searchable, and you can you know go out and search the whole journals. That's great. Good job there. We'll keep you in mind for future things, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, retirement activities. Well, you know, I retired early. I retired, in, you know, when I was 58. What um, year did you retire in? I retired in 01. Okay. And um, I, had, um, I came here in 68. And so I was on, you know, on the faculty for 33 years. Mm -hmm. This and is called the next stage. <laughs> and, um, you know, every one of my sabbatical leaves that I'd taken, and I took three of them while I was at Purdue, which I think is a very good program. A lot of universities don't have it. Even some of our own faculty here don't use it. Uh, I used it for a very, you know, unique, you know, area, and that is, I would use it to go out and do something totally different. And, you know, like I was in basic research and my first sabbatical was at Texas A&M, uh, developing a new course, you know, in teaching. A course that had never been taught in a agronomy department before in mm -hmm. instrumentation analysis. And this was using high sophisticated instrumentation for analysis in agronomy. Um, my next sabbatical was in 19... 90, uh, I went to the University of Nebraska. I was a computer consultant to the executive vice president of the university in, uh, when they were developing their, their statewide computing system, because I'd been involved in here in that ever since 1970, right after I came. And uh, so I went out there as a computer consultant, and then uh, in uh, 1996, I went on a six month sabbatical with the US EPA lab down in Athens, Georgia. Again, um, that one was as close related to research as anything you know that I really did, but it was again different in that I went down to to use a new instrument that had just come onto the market. And, and they uh, had it? And they had it. They had a scanning uh, uh, micro probe. And this thing was able to actually image atoms on the surfaces of clay minerals and uh, there it had just come on the market it had never been used in agronomy and they had one and uh, so I was able to go down and spend six months learning really what it could do for agronomy sure. and so I did the same thing when I retired I retired I'd always been wanting to do some woodwork never had a chance to when I was a University because I never had felt I had enough time to do it, and so I built a 30 by 48 shop and got it fully equipped, and I do a lot of woodworking now. Oh, well, that's very good. And so it, it's it's again something totally different. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, any uh, thing that I forgot to ask, or anything that uh, you'd like to 
intervention or in closing? Well, I think, I think the, you know, I, I, I talked a little bit about, you know, my involvement in, in the Soil Science Society and the Agronomy Society. Um, the other society that I was quite involved in was the Clay Mineral Society, which is in reality my, one of my main areas of research. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was quite involved in it as well. And, uh, Do you still whole, keep your involvement? I, I still keep my membership sure. up. You know, and in fact, I just went out to a Clay Minerals meeting last year, uh, mainly because my, one of my former graduate students just accepted the largest, you know, the highest honor of the society grants. And uh, he asked me to come out for the presentation, and so very nice. And so I went out to Billings, Montana, for that presentation. Right. And so I, I'm still involved, you know. But like many things, like even come back to the university and walking through the agronomy department here after ten years, you know, half the people I don't know. <laughs> and the same that thing, happens. same thing in a national organization. You sure. know, you get into a national meeting now, and you might know a quarter of the people that are there. That's true. But it's good to keep up the association, oh, yeah, I, I, and you run into people that you right. know. Right. You know, and I try to keep up with it. That's right, yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm not involved with it a lot. Okay. The, um, I think the other thing that, um, you know, I've seen changes in the university. I've seen a lot that have been good changes. I've seen one change that I've seen happening in our university. And I, I, Purdue's not single in this, you know, I think it's a change that we've seen in our whole educational scheme and and it concerns me a little bit because in my area of basic research, um, under our basic research umbrella in this country right now, we see that if you propose want to do something, you have to go out and get federal grants or you get a grant from a corporation or whatever. You've got to justify that. And many times these reviews are done by peer review. You know, if you go out for a federal grant, they've got a peer review panel that looks at that grant and, and those members of that peer review panel could be your colleagues, they could be people, you know, that you've encountered, you know, through your old professional career. That's good to a certain aspect. But what happens if you're doing research that go against the grain, go against and trying to disprove some of the well-accepted theories that are out there in the in, uh, literature at that point in time, when you're being peer-reviewed, and that's the total basis of whether you get that grant or not, and your total research program is dependent on you getting that grant, and you go against the accepted norm, or the accepted theory of your peers, your possibilities of being able to get that grant are next to nil. Before, you could, if you had the support of a department head, or you had the support of a dean, you know, financially, you could continue to do a research program like that and get and, and yes, see if you can establish, you know, that as really, you know, this theory is wrong. We need to do something, you know, this, we need to relook at this. Today, you're not going to even have a shot at doing it. Hmm. And I see that as a major change in our university. Before, you know, if, if a department head went along with you and you, you were developing a new technique and you were getting published, he could support you financially to continue a research Help program along like the that. Way. But today you don't have a shot at doing that. You know, the money's in the, in the sport and, and things just aren't there uh, for that. And uh, I see this stifling our research a little bit because we're having the answer to so much in the peer review that if you're doing research that is just the next step down an accepted path, you're going to get funded. But if you're doing research that goes against the accepted norm or indicating a new path that we need to go down and nobody agrees with that, that that is the path that needs to go down, then you never get a shot at it. That's and a and big and challenge. That's, that's a big change that I've seen happening in our university research program right now. 
and I think that's going to come back to bite us at some time because I feel basic research is very important because that in reality becomes our accepted base for the future. Because unless we are doing that basic research and doing it very well, many times we are going against the norm. And I, I see this to be a problem that's going to come back and, and hurt us later on. Change and things like that are, do, do occur and they kind of have to take a, another look. Well, I, and you know, I don't know what the answer is no, here. It's, you know, it's not it, really an answer but, uh, per se. But I, I do see that I think is a result of getting, you know, people involved in these policy decisions that don't want to make the policy and don't want to make the decisions themselves. They want to have a committee make the decision for them, and they're not willing to make that step out on a limb. Because many times, there is no doubt. When you start in down that path, you are going to make mistakes. Sure. Not everything's going to pan out. Not everything's going to have Life a positive result. Life doesn't do result. that for you anyway. You know? That's right. Sure. And somebody's got to make those critical decisions when that research is more important to at least take a look at than to whether you make the right decision or not, whether that research needs to be done. Think it through. Right. Very carefully. Dr. Roth, I want to thank you very much. Mrs. Roth, I want to thank you very much. Yes. Then